Let me first uh, welcome everyone to the development talks of the Harvard Growth Lab. My name is uh, Miguel Santos. I'm the Director of Applied Research at the Harvard Growth Lab, and I have the honor today to moderate this session called Confronting Post-COVID-19 Macroeconomic Challenges, which is something that uh, my, my guest today has been doing for some time now, Ipumbu Shimi, Minister of Finance of Namibia. We're very happy to have him today with us. Shimi has been the Minister of Finance of Namibia since 2020. Before that, he served as governor of the Bank of Namibia for from 2010 to 2020. After a long career at the bank, uh, he holds a Master of Science degree in Financial Economics and a postgraduate diploma in Economic from the University of London. And he also holds a diploma in Foreign Trade and Management from Maastricht School of Management in the Netherlands. Uh, and an honors degree in Economics at the University of uh, Western Cape in South Africa. He's also a bachelor in commerce and economics and accounting at the University of the, of the Western Cape. Before we start, the Growth Lab has had the, the pleasure of being working with the government of Namibia for 1.5 years and a half. So we agreed that I'll make before a first, a very short presentation to get everybody up to date with the situation in Namibia and the challenges the country is facing. And then we'll, we're gonna take it uh, directly with the, with the minister. So for, I mean, Namibia, it's, uh, as, as many of you are aware, Namibia, it's a country that uh, had gone from a colony in 1989 to uh, a functioning, fully functioning democracy, as we can see here. Uh, the other country that went from colony to independence in this period is Eritrea. Uh, the, the country has been working since independence to, to strengthen its state. So state fragility indexes are going um, down, which in this chart mean they are improving. Uh, these are the things economists do. So state fragility is going down. So the country is becoming stronger, stronger than peers. Uh, the state capacity has evolved significantly. Um, Namibia enjoyed a very fast uh, growth acceleration period for 15 years, since 2000 to 2015, that was driven by investments associated to natural resources uh, within the context of the super cycle of commodities. Uh, the country grew income per capita 58% in those 15 years, growing at a compounded annual growth rate of, of 3.4 per year. And it was not all luck. It was not all uh, the boom in commodities. The country significantly increased his uh, share of the world market in its export products and even managed to launch uh, 19 new products in that period that increased its income per capita and um, an amount of 180 per capita. Um, and, at the, and in the meantime, and also since independence, but faster given the growth from 2000 onwards, uh, social indicators like infant mortality decreased significantly, life expectancy increased in parallel to GDP, school enrollment at, at all levels increased significantly. I mean, in tertiary education, it had jumped by a factor of 10 since independence. Uh, and it has a great infrastructure. This is, in, we have discovered and over the course of our work that infrastructure, quality of roads and ports are, it's one of the competitive advantages that Namibia enjoys. Um, the country still has one of the highest income inequality in the world. You can see on the chart on the left, um, Namibia had a Gini coefficient by 2015 at the peak of the windfall. Uh, that was among the highest in the world, just trailing South Africa. And it has also one of the lowest participation rates among peers and highest unemployment rates. So this is one of the most significant challenges the country is facing, that most of the growth was recorded in industries that are not labor intensive and therefore um, jobs didn't pick, uh, didn't pick up. Um, and the period of growth uh, ended as the super commodity cycle ended. So the investment boom in Namibia stopped in 2014. Uh, this is not a Namibian phenomenon. Here we can see that uh, countries receiving uh, investments in extractive sectors experienced a significant uh, down, downward trend in investment. Um, and that meant for Namibia's slowdown in the grade of, of growth 
uh, since 2015, and that was when the where the country was when COVID-19 hit. Of course, as commodities came down, the country was forced to make a significant fiscal adjust, adjustment. So public expenditures came down from 2015 to 2020 by six percentage points of GDP. That's a massive uh, fiscal adjustment. The primary deficits came very close to zero. Uh, the difference being the, the increase in interest payments. Uh, but COVID-19 forced the country to implement an aggressive response to face, face the shock that brought the deficit back um, almost to the level where it was before the fiscal adjustment. So now Namibia is slowly starting to consolidate its fiscal accounts again. Uh, the country has a lot of credibility on the international community, um, entered on the RFI program with the IMF and IMF authorities. And it's a perception of, of many in the development world that it's in track in spite of the persistent fiscal deficits that are the aftermath of the COVID shock, the country has a plan to bring fiscal sustainability back. So those are the three challenges that Namibia is facing. It's facing a, a growth challenge because growth slowed down in 2015 and took a deep dive on COVID, on the COVID crisis. An inclusion challenge because even at the peak of the windfall, uh, the country still had the second largest inequality rate in the world, very low labor market participation. And the country has a fiscal challenge because, um, uh, yeah, the, the COVID-19 re uh, response uh, brought the level of fiscal deficit back to where it was before the, the adjustment. So the challenge for Namibia, and that's what we're going to talk about with the minister today, is how do you improve along one or two of these dimensions without deteriorating the others at the same time? Or, or if you want, are there any measures and policies that can hit these three dimensions at the time? So that's a, that's a setting. Uh, minister, we're very happy to have you. I know you are charging people that call you minister a rate of one US dollar for every time, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna call you minister throughout. And yeah, that's how we get started. So we wanted to hear about your experience. Where is Namibia now? How are you feeling? What has been really hard of going through this crisis? And I had a question as well. Is there anything that has been a positive surprise? Is there any factor that reacted in a more positive way than you expected? Any help you got from the international community? Is there any surprising plus over this like myriad of negative news the country and the media is getting since the outburst of COVID-19? Thank you a lot, Miguel. I, I, uh, I hope you can all hear me. And uh, let me thank Harvard for um, inviting me. I really feel honored to be part of this conversation. Um, uh, Miguel, you, you, you still have to pay. You cannot escape the, the fee that you, that you have to pay for calling me minister. Um, but we can only talk about when am I going to collect. So maybe, maybe I can collect with a, with a leg so I can give you some some time to get the money, but the uh, thing you have to pay. Well, um, you, you, you have more or less sketched the situation in Namibia, uh, the economic situation, um, as you have said. Um, it's, it, it has been a challenging situation, especially since the pandemic started. The pandemic already found us in a very difficult position, um, given the fact that the commodity super cycle came to an end. And of course, government was also consolidating at the same time. Um, so we were faced with, with two evils, so to speak. Um, one, your revenue has, has, has come down and is coming down because really part of, um, of the strategy of, of fighting the pandemic was, was to try and, 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 and restrain economic activities. You restrain mobility, um, you, um, you lock up the country, um, no people from outside are allowed to come in. People from inside cannot move around and therefore economic activities are constrained. With that constrained economic activity, it means your revenue is also going down quite significantly. And that's one thing we have seen. The, the second evil is that while your revenue is going down, um, your expenditure will have to go up because now you have to spend more money on health. You, 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 you have to spend money on social grants. Um, for instance, when we started, um, combating the pandemic at the very beginning. And, and unfortunately, there was no playbook that time. 
So we, we, we didn't really, you know, have a playbook to look at and see how are we responding to this, to this pandemic? Should we lock up the economy? Should we keep it open? And there was a lot of debates between, of course, our colleagues from the health sector and us from the, from the economic side um, to try and, and, and see whether we can find, you know, a, a suitable balance or an appropriate balance as to how you can, how you, 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 you can keep economic activity still, still um, you know, going or still being active or, or the economy, you know, we allow people still to, to be active while at the same time um, introducing measures that are going to contain the pandemic. So this debate, uh, when, when you are in a crisis and in, in a pandemic, you tend to listen more to the doctors than to listen to the economist. And, and, and the, at the beginning, we were leaning more towards listening to the doctors and um, then listening to the, to the economist. So as a result, you know, we, uh, we locked up the country. Um, but as I, say, as I said, apart from, apart from now, you know, giving grants, you, you also had to spend money on the, on, on, on health, on the health, on, on the health, uh, health um, measures to contain the pandemic. On, on, the, on the grants, we had to introduce because basically many people who, who were deriving their livelihoods on, on the informal economy, and, and that's quite a significant number in Namibia, um, because of the measures that government ha has taken, these people could no longer function. They could no longer li de derive any livelihood. So we send them home. Now, during that time, so they, they were facing two choices. Either they, they starve to, to death because they, they, don't, they are not getting any, any income at all and therefore they cannot buy food, or we'll have to help them. So we introduced an emergency income grant. Um, and and, and, and uh, the question was, how do we deliver it in the space of three weeks? Um, what sort of infrastructure do we have to deliver this social grant in, in, in three weeks to those that have lost their livelihood? Um, and, uh, and, and, and I believe we came up with a very innovative um, idea of you know, using the banking system through electronic money. We could deliver the, the, the electronic wallets to, to the qualifying people and money got to the hands of, um, into the hands of the, of, of, of the deserving um, Namibians within a, a period of a, of, of a week and a half or so. It's something which, um, which is um, uh, novel. It, it's not something that we have done before in Namibia. Um, and and, um, and, and I, I believe it's something that we can still replicate in the future if, if we have to, to, to distribute grant in a most efficient way, because it was quite cost effective. We have not really spent, spent money on, uh, on the distribution of, uh, of these grants. So those were, those were the two evils that, were, that we were facing. Now, Miguel, you have asked the, the question of, is there any silver lining in this? Um, I'm not sure whether they, they, they say any silver lining in, uh, in the pandemic, but what I, have, what I have seen is when you are facing difficult economic situation, generally people, are, people also have a, a better understanding about the reforms that have to be undertaken. So if there's any silver lining in this is that people were willing to listen. When you say, we are facing a very difficult situation, we have to reform, people were, were, were listening better than before. So that's probably the, the, the silver lining. When, when we started with a pandemic, um, one of the of the big ticket items in terms of our expenditure was this, the money that we were spending on our national airline, which was making losses year in, year out. Um, the conversation was then, is this sustainable? Can we, can we maintain it for, you know, you know, going forward? Or should we basically cut our losses and, um, and, and, and close, close the airline? Then, then the national debate started and then ultimately to cut this, the long story short, we agreed to liquidate the airline. Before, before the pandemic, I believe that was going to be extremely difficult because there is a lot of um, sentimental value that is attached to the airline. People who, who still talk about their flags that they see on their planes and, and things like that. So this is probably one of the silver linings that, are, that, that, that I see in, in the pandemic that, you know, the propensity to, to reform, it, it's higher than during normal times. And, and that's probably the, the, the silver lining in there. You have asked a question about, you know, is there support from multi multilateral institutions? I, I, I believe the, the, the fact that this was a global pandemic, um, the response was also global. So in terms of countries working together um, to contain the pandemic, 
um, in, in terms of multilateral financial institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank availing facilities and also, of course, also the African Development Bank availing facility to help countries to, to, to contain the crisis. And, and of course, making financial resources available for, for, the, for countries to, you know, to, to be able to absorb these um, significant losses in, in, in revenue. Um, for instance, the IMF um, introduced a, a rapid facility, a, a rapid financing facility um, that you know, many developing countries could access, and Namibia was one of those that, that could access that, that facility to be able to, you know, to, to, be able to, you know, to finance this needed expenditure during these difficult times when, uh, when revenue has collapsed. Um, the African Development Bank also uh, launched a similar facility um, and, 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 and the World Bank. So I think there was a lot of support from different angles um, from multilateral institutions. To, um, to, help, to help countries such as Namibia to, 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 com to contain the pandemic and, and, and of course to um, um, help uh, with, to manage the financial losses that, uh, that are caused by the pandemic. So let and me start there. You one may question have that I, I, I want to encourage people to ask their questions. The minister have asked me that we move fast to Q and A's. He's very direct. He would like to hear from from people, direct questions. So I'm gonna ask one or two more questions and then we're gonna to turn to people. But one thing I wanted to ask you is the first time I went to Namibia uh, and we were someone in that meeting in that outdoors at Midgard. Uh, I, I've been in these meetings in many parts of the world. Uh, but the first thing uh, we did is you stand up and sing the national anthem. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever forget that moment. I learned that, that Namibians are very nationalistic in, in the good sense of the word. They love their country. They're willing to work hard and they're very proud people. And linked to the pride on the nation, I wanted to ask you a question of something that I, I've been curious about, which is I've heard you say in, in, in many places like that Namibia asked for the uh, rapid financing instrument of the IMF, uh, but we have never been to the IMF before. We have never need to go to the IMF before. And there's an element of pride there that I wanted to ask you about. Is this, is this more a, 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 just a signal of, of capacity to stand for yourself? Is this a signal of a Renman of ideology? Uh, what is this about? <laughs> well, that's, that's an interesting question, Miguel. I, I, I believe, it, it's it's uh, it's it's both of that. Um, the the understanding here in Namibia is that you know countries run to the IMF as a last resort when they can no longer you know finance their um, you know their budgets within within the domestic resources that are available to them with taxes and of course the domestic financial markets and also the you know commercial capital markets so you run to the imf when you are in a crisis when you are in a serious crisis you don't have any other choice so the mantra in Namibia has been let's manage the you know financial resources of government in such a way that we'll never run to the imf because that will be a sign of failure um so it's seen as a sign of failure on 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 on, on the part of those that are managing the country so that that has been the hesitancy the other reason is that I think we are somehow fortunate um, compared to other developing countries, especially on the continent, that we have a functioning financial market. We are able to, to raise 80% of our funding needs, government funding needs from the domestic market because we have uh, quite significant savings relative to our GDP. And, and all those savings can be accessed by government as well. Um, if, if, if I can just give you a figure, um, our, uh, our, our institutional saving, it's, it's more than 100% of GDP. So not many countries are in that position and, and therefore they, can, they, they don't really have, and, and IMF may not be the, the lender of last resort in their cases. Uh, it could be the lender of maybe second resort or even first resort in, 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 some, in some instances. So I think that's, that probably explains why you know, our reluctance to, to go to the IMF. But the IMF is an institution that, um, that we own. We are members of the IMF. And uh, it's, it's an institution that was established to help countries to manage crisis. And, uh, and, and, and the pandemic is, is one of those crises. 
and 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 and, and therefore um, we will not always shy away from going to the IMF um, if there are good reasons to do that. But we wouldn't want to run to the IMF because we were unable to manage our affairs internally. I hope I have answered your question. You have. You have. Uh, before we move on to, to the public minister, I wanted to touch upon uh, your personal story uh, because, uh, I mean, your story is kind of the story of many Namibians uh, that are coming from the north uh, to the capital to try to make a living and improve and improve its standards of living. And you are a, you are a success story. And I guess that's, we are all working to give every Namibian the possibility of have a story like the one you, you have had, a success story that they can tell their children and be proud of and because they got opportunities. So coming from the north to the capital, the, the north of Namibia for people not familiar with this is it's mostly rural, uh, communal land predominates and it's a very fertile land. So it holds a, a, a significant majority, not a majority, but a fairly large number of Namibians are located there. Uh, and, and you came to Vinduk uh, at some point. Uh, what was difficult? What did you miss when you arrived? Uh, what was the toughest part of coming to town? And then when you flew to study abroad? <laughs> yeah, well, well, Miguel, Miguel, I don't know whether, whether it's really a success story. We, we... Whether maybe you know, we, I happen to be a question of luck. But I think one thing I should I should mention is that uh, yes, indeed, I, I grew up in the rural area, um, looking after cattle and goats. Um, so that was my main activity. Apart from going to school, I was fortunate to go to school. But probably the main the, the main reason why um, probably where where I am today is because I benefited from relatively good education compared to others that were in the same position. Um, in my secondary school, I happened to go to, I, have it, I came to capital, to the capital uh, during that time when I, when I started secondary school. And, and uh, I, I went to a, a Catholic school. And that was more or less of an elite school that time for black people. Of course, there were other, other good schools, but uh, you know, um, that time before independence, it, it was only for, you know, for, um, for a certain, sector of the population, which was basically the, the white population. So the school where I went, uh, it, it's, it was considered to be a very, very good school. So I don't ascribe any, you know, any success that I have achieved to anything else that I'm an extraordinary person. I'm just, just a normal, normal child, normal students like any others. But probably the fact that I have, uh, I, you know, I benefited from a relatively good education helped me to to, to, uh, to bring me to where I am today. That's one. The second thing is that uh, I, I started working also for a relatively good institution. Um, you, you mentioned earlier that I used to be at the Central Bank. Um, I had been in that institution for 25 years. Um, and, and, and I think the Bank of Namibia is probably one of the success stories of Namibia in terms of uh, institutional development. Before independence, we didn't have any Central Bank. We had to establish one from scratch, but it's an institution that has done well in terms of um, creating, you know, stability, um, delivering on its mandate, but also developing people. And 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 I've benefited from you know exposure, meeting people like Miguel, smart people like Miguel and others. And um, you know that's a privilege that don't not not many Namibians have. So again, nothing extraordinary. It's education and exposure. I just happen to be fortunate. <laughs> Many people that came to the capital, Ipumbo, I was impressed that if they had children, they left them back in the north with the grandparents. And yeah. I mean, when I asked if that was economic reasons, people said, yes, of course, but it's not economic. So where are they going to learn our culture if we bring them here? So that also seems to be an important component that people in the north is proud of their culture and they feel if we migrate the whole family, then who's going to teach the kids the culture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's partly also historical um, because people who came to the capital, and you asked me, I mean, and I haven't answered your question on um, what was the most difficult part when I came to the capital. The first thing was language. I could hardly speak English, and I could speak I could hardly speak Afrikaans, which was the lingua franca of of um, of you know most parts of Namibia. So it was difficult to communicate. But fortunately, I was still a bit young, so I could still pick up English and I could still pick up Afrikaans. Um, so if you ask me to learn a language now, I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult. 
Now, I was saying it's partly, it's partly also for historical reasons before, because we, 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 we had a system where you could, you could only be in certain parts of Namibia if you have a permit to be, to be in, um, in, in, in these parts of Namibia. So you were, not re, you, you were not allowed to stay in the capital, for instance, if you have a permit. So it, you were on a contract system. So you come to work, you work, your contract expires, you go back. So people still consider, consider where they came from as, as their home because they were, um, they, were, they, they were basically a temporary. Now that I think has passed on from generations to generations. So now we don't have that system anymore, but still people still think that's home. Where they are in the capital, that's not home for them. So they are just here to work. And then uh, when, they, when they retire, they will go back home. Um, and of course, they are great, their parents and grandparents are there. They, 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 they will leave their children there with their grandparents. But I think that's changing, though. It's, um, I, I don't think that's something that is going to, to continue for a long time. With the rate at which urbanization is happening in Namibia, um, I think the future generation will not consider where their parents came from as home. I think their home will be everywhere in Namibia. So maybe if you come back to Miguel after 10 years, you will probably find less and less people who will tell you that you know we left our children there because that's home. Um, the majority will probably have their children around here. <laughs> I hope I answered your question. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to turn to some of the questions that people is asking. A uh, few of them are going to put you in trouble with the central bank where you previously worked because it's a classic tension in crisis and it has been at the forefront of, of the, in the US over the previous presidency. Uh, they need to have a quantitative easing or a lax monetary policy so that the economy can recover. Uh, versus the central bank potel, potential concerns with inflation, and in the case of Namibia, with the with the peg of the of the Namibian dollar to the South African rand. So uh, two of the questions that I'm having are related to: Do you think the central bank is doing enough? I'm not going to put you in the, to that sort of trouble, uh, but I will want to ask: How has been the coordination? I think you are in a unique position because you were before at the central bank, and now at the Minister of Finance. Do you feel that you change hats or this is pretty much people it's on the same boat and there has been agreements? And there's a very good question from someone at the Kennedy School on the subsidies that you granted business over the pandemic to allow them to survive. How do you roll them back and when and how's that process been? Two questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, well, and the first one is a very difficult question. So I um, I'm not sure whether I will be able to answer it satisfactorily, but maybe the fortunate thing is that when the pandemic started, I was I was I was I was at the central bank, um, and, um, and 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 that time already the central bank decided to relook at its monetary policy, and it was actually um, the, my last meeting at, at the central bank, the monetary policy committee, that. That was a meeting where interest rate we uh, reduced aggressively. That's one. We then also started looking at the provisioning, or the central bank started at the provisioning rules of, 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 of commercial banks, so, so that commercial bank can be a bit more lenient because the business sector is going to struggle. And, and then, therefore, if we keep the provisioning rules the same, it, it, we are just killing an, an entity that is already that is already struggling. So the central bank has already, I mean, at the, Right from the beginning, the central bank has has you know uh, introduced supply and ease um, you know the situation for, for for businesses because you don't want to kill businesses because it's difficult to establish a new a new business than maintaining a new one. Uh, I mean maintaining an existing one. So that's one. I think even then then I left. I came to the Minister of Finance. So again, during the pandemic time, so the central bank continued to do the same, you know, uh, reducing interest rates. I think over the over the, the currency of the pandemic, the central bank has probably uh, reduced interest rate by, by if I'm not mistaken, probably 300 um, basis points. Um, so, and and of course, um, you have you have asked about coordination. Um, the uh, you know the the Minister of Finance or government is. You know, is introduced was introducing measures to to uh, to support businesses. You have talked about it, um, providing emergency grants. So that was done 
in unison with, with, with the central bank, there has been a lot of discussions. Um, we even introduced actually a, a scheme that was going to help, especially the small businesses. Um, and that scheme was funded by the central bank, but the, 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 the losses were, were guaranteed by, by, by the central government. So there has been a lot of coordination. And I think that's coordination between central banks and, and the Minister of Finance uh, is very critical. Um, to the well-being of the economy, I, whether you are in a crisis mode or whether you, you are in, in peace times, normal times. So that, that is always critical. Um, of course, there are inherent conflicts. Um, you know, um, sometimes we want lower interest rates as, as, as government because you know, we want to reduce our cost of funding. Um, but the central banks also have their own mandate to ensure that you know, um, they, 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 they keep the value of the currency, they keep inflation low. Um, so I hope I answered your question then. Let me now move on to the, to the, to the other question of, um, uh, of the, the subsidies that, that we have provided. Mm -hmm. uh, the fortunate thing is that all these subsidies were temporary. They, uh, they, you know, they, they had a, a definite um, expiry date. Um, for instance, one of the subsidies that we have introduced was a subsidy for those that, that, um, that lost employment. So that was a subsidy for about three, three months or so. Yeah, so they could claim from, you know, the social security uh, benefits, but, you know, central government also then backed it up. We also introduced a subsidy to businesses that also lost their, their livelihoods, um, you know, to, to help them pay, to pay wages and salaries. And again, that was for a period of six, of six months, and all those subsidies have expired. So it's not, there's no longer a question of rolling them back because they are no longer in existence. So I hope I, I have answered your question, question there. Yeah, 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 you have. <laughs> you have to the extent that you can respond a question uh, on the central bank, which is putting you in an uncomfortable position. So, uh, Patricio, are we having uh, some fellows at the lab coming to ask questions directly of the ones that we have in line? Yes, I think we can invite Tim McNaught to ask a question here. But Put him as panelist and see if he comes. Tim, so if you are free to ask your question directly to the minister now. Okay, uh, thank you, Minister. Um, I had the question written down, but I can't see it anymore. But anyways, I was I was really fascinated by the uh, the mobile payments, the social grant um, program that you did, and I found it really fascinating and a way new way the government used technology in really an effective way. And I was wondering if there were other examples of digitization of government that um, throughout the pandemic, where you feel like there's been an improved processes or if there's been other successes um, related to digitization of government. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, yes, uh, I think that's that's where we need to go. You know, digital transformation. Um, that's that's where we need to go because I think technology is improving and technology is going to help us to streamline our processes and actually become become more efficient. Uh, as to during the crisis, I, whether we made progress in terms of um, digital transformation, um, we have not really done much during that time. I, I think earlier on, we we introduced um, you know. Um, services that we you know, went online, for instance, company registration now is online, um, but that that has that happened before the before the pandemic, before the crisis. Um, so, in a number of services were were put online. Uh, for instance, when you know banks query their you know we, we, when they want to, to uh, confirm an identity of, a, of 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 somebody that that is also that is also digitalized. So a number of that, but during the crisis, unfortunately, I think we lost a bit of momentum. So we we we, we focused more of our energy on on, on fighting the crisis and and uh, instead of, uh, of of continuing with the digital transformation agenda. But the agreement is that that's really the way to go for Namibia. Namibia is, as you have seen from Miguel, he showed a picture. It's um, you know maybe from the map, you're not you're not able to get a full you know, understanding of how, how big this country is. It's, it's quite a sizable um, country with low density. So you find people that are, you know, 1,000 away from the capital, but there are not many, 
but you still have to provide them with uh, basic social services. You know, they need health services. Um, they need, you know, water and, and, you know, electricity and things like that. But because of lower density, the cost of, 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 of providing those services is very, very high. So the, the future is really to look at, at um, how, how do you use technology to still deliver these services in a cost-effective manner? Um, so we have, we have made some progress, but I think there's more work to be done in that area. Great. Minister, while, while we promote the next speaker to platform, we have a question from Paul Hasselbrink that I think it's worth addressing. Uh, how much do you see inequality being a constraint to long-term growth, to the long-term growth we're, we're going, we're trying to pursue? Uh, and I, the question is asked, like, how much some inclusive growth uh, can affect or promote long-term long, long growth? And how do you see inequality playing as a constraint to that? Absolutely. I think in, in inequality is, is, is a big challenge in, in two ways, in my view. First of all, it, it's, it's important to have some social stability. Now, when you have a society which is highly unequal, you have those that are few that are commanding all the resources, and, and I'm included in, 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 the, in, in, the, in that group. And you have the majority which is struggling to make a living, you have a social problem. Uh, because soon the majority will start to demand things that you can probably not provide. So it's not, it's not fair. The wealth of, of the country is not equally distributed, and that could lead to social unrest. You don't want a situation like that. So in any society, there has to be some fair balance um, in terms of the distribution of resources. You probably, I, don't, I haven't seen a society where the, the, it's equal distribution of, uh, of, of resources. But, you know, um, a lower Gini coefficient of maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4, like the Scandinavian countries, although inequality is also, is also increasing there. So that's already a constraint on, the, on, on, um, on, on, on that level. But also, in, in terms of purchasing power, I think it's also a constraint. So if, if you have, if, if you, you put all the resources in me, I can only buy one bread per week. So you, you are also constant, constant, constraining purchasing power because I will probably, you know, uh, save all that money, not spend, not spend it in Namibia. I will, I will go and to visit uh, Miguel in, in, in London and spend the money there. So it doesn't really help the economy. So it, it constrains economic growth because it also constrains purchasing power. Mm -hmm. So from those two perspectives, you actually want to reduce inequality because it's, it's not a, a good evil to live with. So that, that, that's, 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 that's how I see it. So it's definitely something, it's a priority for Namibia, it's something that we need to tackle. We need to create growth that is inclusive, that is creating jobs, especially for the majority of, of those that are looking for jobs. Um, I think that way we can, we can really help to, to, to reduce inequality. Although, as I said, this is a worldwide problem. Um, in Namibia, we can probably still reduce it further before we start the rest of the world to see how, how do we make, how, how do you keep it low? Because I think that's, that's a challenge at the moment in the world. Absolutely. You're going to get a question now from someone you know, which is uh, Nikita Taniparti. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you, Minister. I think we've had the honor of knowing and learning much about Namibia recently. But for someone totally unfamiliar with the current context of Namibia, um, having listened to what Miguel presented and some of the responses you've given, what should they know about the broad opportunities for economic development in Namibia? What's something that you think is not as known to the rest of the world? And where do you see the challenges to overcoming? Uh, where, where do you see the challenges that need to be overcome to see these come to life? Well, Nikita, that's a, that's a difficult question. Um, we, we believe as a country um, that, that there are economic opportunities. Um, I mean, Miguel has showed you what has happened in the past that the country was growing um, and it, it was growing relatively fast for you know almost a decade um miguel has showed showed you that the country could you know move into new industries gain more market share 
So I think what, what is left now is for us to, to become a bit more innovative and, and um, start to figure out what else can be done. What can we, what, which are the new areas of flow? One, for instance, which, um, which, we, we, which uh, we, we, we are aggressively pursuing, um, one strategic bet, you make, if you want to call it that way, is that the country is, has got access to renewable um, energy in terms of wind and solar. Um, we, we are one of the best in the world. Uh, you know, comparable to countries like Chile and, um, and, and, and Saudi Arabia. Um, so the question that we're asking ourselves, how do we make use of this renewable resource that we have? Um, of course, we need energy. We import some of our energy from our neighbors. But also, how can we use, make use of this energy, for instance, to move into new areas, for instance, uh, green hydrogen? So that's something that we, have, that we are pursuing very, very aggressively. Um, at COP26 in November, I believe it was in November, uh, in Glasgow, um, we, we just announced, because we went through a, you know, a request or proposal process where we invited bidders to, you know, to, bid, to come in and, and actually um, do pilots and ex experiments in Namibia. So we gave them a piece of land um, and access to our, you know, to, to our water to come in and, 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 and test whether, you know, the potential of, of, of green hydrogen. And that was awarded or that was an, the award was announced at COP26. Um, so we, we are now in the process of, uh, of finalizing this with a, with a bidder, with a successful bidder, um, who is going to deploy his own capital um, over the next 18 months or so to really, you know, demonstrate the potential of, uh, the green hydrogen sector in, in, in Namibia. So that's one area. The other areas, of course, we, we believe that, um, you know, they, as a country, we, we have now looked together with Harvard Growth Lab, uh, looked at, you know, um, which areas we, we, can we diversify into in terms of already existing industries that are in, in, in existence, maybe small, how do we scale them up? And, and also in terms of new industries, what are the comparative advantages do we have? So we have now come up with a list of, 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 of pro, pro products, 75, which we have you know, split in, into, into phases, like this will be the priorities for the next five years or so, the next phase, and then, and then the, third, the third phase. So what this requires is a, a close collaboration between private sector and, and public sector. Uh, because public sector will have to provide the missing, you know, public goods, you know, infrastructure, energy, um, telecommunication services, where private sector cannot, you know, um, make a significant contribution. These public goods have, have to be provided by government. And also to coordinate the, the different entities. So we, we, we believe if, if we improve our coordination, if we improve our dialogue with a with specific public sector or private sector that we are targeting that can exploit these opportunities, um, Namibia's, Namibia's growth trajectory can change and you can start to grow again in an inclusive manner, in a manner that is going to create jobs and in a manner that will hopefully help us to reduce inequality. Um, Nikita, that's, that's more or less um, what I could say, but if you want me to add more, you can, you, you, you can come back. We're going to have uh, uh, another of our project fellows, Alessia Lockman, uh, coming up. Uh, to ask a question. I have a few questions, Minister, in the chat while Alexia comes up on the African continental free trade area. Uh, how do you think that can help uh, economic growth prospects post pandemic? If you think is it going uh, too slow, is it going to result in intra Africa trade within Southern Africa or, uh, or trade creation versus diversion? What are your thoughts? <clears throat> So do you want me to talk about that question now or do you want to yep. ask to uh, it for Alexia first? Okay, very good. I think that's, that's an opportunity that is, that is really opening up for the continent. Um, the fact that you know, the continent is, is um, dropping the tariff barriers, it, 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 it's dropping all other, you know, all the, all other barriers to trade, I think it's, it's an opportunity that Namibia would want to, to exploit. Um, so our message to, to the investors is that we want to work with them to come and set up here, you know, produce goods for, for the continent, uh, because it, it, it's a continent of, um, of more than 1 billion people. And, and, uh, and, and fortunately, this population is, is still growing. And I, I think last time I checked, it's, it's probably still the continent that is going to have a, 
you know, a, a positive growth in terms of population until until 2060 or so. So it's still a population that is going to create young people and probably the market is going to, is going to change and hopefully the, the purchasing power is also going to change. So I believe there are enormous opportunities um, and, and, and therefore as a country, we're actually positioning ourselves. That's why we are looking at the comparative advantage that we have. Um, so that when we are talking to the investors and we want to target those specific ones that can actually, you know, um, that have an interest and that have already produced the kind of, 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 of products and services that, um, that, 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 that we, we are seeing as an opportunity to, you know, to produce in Namibia or to deliver in Namibia to come and set up here and, and service the continent. So that's definitely an enormous opportunity. Where are we now? Um, the tra free trade area has been launched. Um, I think January 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and now we are basically just, you know, doing the, the final rounds of making sure that, you know, we're comparing our tariff, um, tar tariff schedules um, so, we, so that everybody, we make sure that everybody meets the tariff schedules and also making sure that the rules of origins, um, you know, mm -hmm. I agreed upon and, and, and I implemented according to agreement because that, that can be a source of, uh, of, of um, disagreements if, if you don't agree on, a, on, 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 rules of, on the rules of origin, because I can import things from, from the US or from China or from, from India and, um, and, 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 and export that to, to the rest of the continent. But those are not things that are produced on the continent. So I, I, I will be cheating. So we will have to make sure that the rules of origins are agreed upon and, and everybody complies with the, with the rules of origin. So that's where we are, but this is an enormous opportunity. Alexia, go ahead. Hello, Minister. Thank you so much, uh, Miguel, for, uh, for giving me the floor. Minister, it is good to speak with you again and to hear your voice, to see you. We have had the great pleasure to meet and uh, I really hope I can, uh, I can visit Namibia again soon. I fell absolutely in love with the country and the people. Um, so, so yeah, I think my question uh, rotates back a little bit to something we have touched upon earlier, which is kind of the, the digital economy. And I wonder, um, do you see some potential for especially um, younger people? Let's say, for example, in, in um, the, the northern areas, for example, to learn skills, um, digital skills that then they can work with in accordance with the international community. So for example, people don't necessarily have to emigrate to the cities to work, but maybe if they're connected to a digital um, framework and if they have some skills, they can actually work from what now they still consider home and sort of build an economy around that. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about your thoughts with this regard. Thank you, Alexia. And, uh... I, I hope you will come back soon. I, I know that you, you, you know, you were here, and, but unfortunately, we, you didn't have, you, you, you were not able to um, visit the whole of Namibia, and uh, you could no longer do what you were supposed to be doing because of the, of the pandemic. But um, hopefully, um, things are going to change soon, and you will come back again. Now, you mentioned, you have mentioned very, very important things: um, the digital economy. You know. You, the use of technology. I, I believe that's the future. The future is really in digital transformation. And, and, and I think from a government perspective, um, the you know, government has to intervene in, in different ways. One, you know, to expose children, learners at a young age. So we must make school and make sure that children at school are all, all, already exposed to technology so that when, when they when they start to use technology, they are already used to technologies. That way, um, I believe we will open up those opportunities that you're talking about. So that's one. The other one is, is, is um, providing um, connectivity infrastructure. Um, by and large, this is done by the private sector now. Um, but they, they, they still some you know, level of public goods that have to be provided. They, as, I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there are areas in Namibia where the densities are very, very low. So it's difficult for the private sector to go there and provide connectivity infrastructure because it's simply not profitable. And that's probably where the you know, where, where, where government has to come in and, uh, and, and help to, to, um, to provide those connectivity infrastructure. So the question is, how do we fund it? So it, that's now the question we are trying to wrap our arms around. Um, it's a question of um, 
you know, different ideas. You know, um, for instance, one, the universal access fund. Can we, can we consider establishing something like that where we, we can collect some levies from, you know, the users of telecommunication, you know, services and maybe part of, of that money can actually be redeployed in, um, in, 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 in areas where it's not profitable for the private sector to go there. So that way you unlock that demand and, and, and that way you, you, you know, you, you expose uh, people in that area to, to technology early enough. Um, so that they can actually make start making use of uh, of technology, and they don't have to come to town as you say, but they can they can still provide a service. So I think there are different areas where, yeah, government will have to intervene. This is a very very critical area. So it it it's in fact an area that is enjoying fo the focus of government. If you look at our um, uh, our um, plan, which is, which is for the next five years, um, it's called the, the Harambe Prosperity Plan, which is basically uh, the active government development of, development plan for now. Um, it's, there's a pillar on connectivity infrastructure because this is a key to unlock some of these opportunities in the outlying areas where um, people are still migrating to town. But of course, the, the rate of migration is not something that you can um, you can stop. I think that that is the natural thing. Um, but you still want people who are going to remain there to have access to to these services, and and maybe they can they can um, sell their labor um, while they are still there. But you know, um, through um, you know technological platforms. Let me leave it there, Alexia. But should come back to Namibia. We can have more of this discussion. Thank you so much, Minister. Yes, I. We are planning on hopefully coming back very soon. I'm excited about that. Thank you again. Minister, thank you very much. Uh, we want to be, I mean, respectful with your time because you know, people don't know, but we know that today you're coming from a long session in parliament uh, to pick up this chat after a long day. We really appreciate having the opportunity to exchange ideas with you. Uh, this is, has been, I can tell you, this has been one of the most uh, populated uh, talks that we have had in, in the growth development uh, talks. Uh, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to continue working together. I hope you have enjoyed the, the talk. And, and as I told you once, we are, we're very excited to work in Namibia and we wanna, we wanna make a difference there, help you achieve all the goals that you have been pursuing. Uh, Cause it's a great success story. Uh, and it can be a, a great success story. And as I said, we want to tell all children, you know, when Namibia started, I was there with the minister, she, me, and a group of people that was working hard to bring the country together and improve the standards of living. So I appreciate the opportunity and I appreciate having you today on our talk. Thank, thank you a lot, Miguel. And uh, let me thank you and, and your colleagues at the, the Growth Lab for inviting me to participate in this conversation it has been an absolute pleasure to uh, you know um to um engage all those that are on this platform but it has also been an absolute absolute pleasure to work with a growth lab um you know it's, it's, it's a professional team um it, it's a team that is willing to make a difference and and therefore I'll con i continue to look forward to continue to work with uh, with with the team and uh, to the rest of the the harvard community um Thanks once again for um, inviting me to be part of the conversation and I look forward to further conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening in Vinduk, uh, Minister, and thanks everybody for your interest.